right now here's a plant the other day when we were looking at the goldenrod I was telling you the about a plant that causes allergies seasonal allergies for late summer and that's what this plant is this is called ragweed and ragweed has these very tiny pollen grains that are really a huge problem for people that have allergies this time of year and cause hay fever and things like that and it's because it has these very fine pollen grains I don't know if you can see how well you can see this I won't bump this and maybe see if we can get some pollen to go blowing away but a lot of times when when the pollen is uh, uh, really high on these species or on these plants it'll blow in the wind and you can actually knock it loose on your fingers and uh, watch it watch it blow I don't recommend being very close to it if that's if you are allergic to it but this is ragweed and you know, these whole this whole thing here that you see this is the inflorescence of so the flowers these little teeny tiny things and this particular flower or this particular inflorescence is called a spike okay because these flowers are, cl are very close to the stem okay but that's what this is called a spike type inflorescence um, it's hairy got hairy stems again I don't know how well you can see that but it's called ragweed and ragweed there's two species in North Carolina. There's this one and one called giant ragweed. And it looks somewhat different from this one. All right, we're gonna look at a couple different species right here. So this is called sweet gum. And sweet gum is a type of tree that has what's known as a palmately veined leaf. Okay, if you look at the leaf, all the veins originate from the same point. Okay, like a palm tree, like a palm branch. So if you imagine each one of these as being an individual uh, vein here, it's palmately veined because they all come from the same point. Okay, and this is what we call palmately lobed. Okay, sweet gum is a, um, has what is called a simple leaf. Okay, because it's a single leaf um, to uh, the petiole. This is this this thing here is called the petiole, and it's one leaf. Okay, and a leaf is typically characterized by the fact that it has a bud, and this is next year's bud. And on trees, the leaf will usually be just beneath. The, uh, the next year's bud. So when this leaf falls off, this bud here will be what comes out next year, okay, in the spring. Okay, and they, they, this will leave a scar. So when this falls off, it will leave a scar right there where it was attached. Okay, but inside this leaf, there's vascular tissue that helps to move food and water up and down the stem. Okay, and that's the sugars that are being made by the leaf through photosynthesis are going down this stem and to the roots where they'll be stored so that the tree can survive the winter. Okay, but sweet gum is a very interesting species. Um, it has a very um, liquidy uh, sap, which has been used, it's very sticky, and so it has been used for uh, chewing gum and uh, glue and things like that. Uh, but uh, really interesting species, and there's a ton of it here at Dittmer Watts, where we're at right now. Okay, here's a tree species that I want you to become familiar with. Okay, I want you to look, take a very good close look at this leaf. This is called yellow poplar or tulip poplar. It has a very interesting leaf, but they're typically what we call four lobed. Okay, one, two, three, four. Okay, so four lobes. Okay, this one is what we call alternately or alternate leaved. Okay, because if the leaves here, if we look at their spacing, here's a leaf, and then the one that's on the opposite side is down from this particular leaf. So these are alternate leaved. Okay, alternate leaf, alternate, alternate branching. I got a mosquito on my nose. And 
Um, if this were opposite leaved, then you'd have a, one leaf directly across from the other. But these um, are, what we, again, simple leaves, similar to what we saw with the sweet gum. Okay. And where the leaf comes out right here, this is called a node. Okay. And the space in between is the inner node. Okay, so you have nodes and inner nodes, okay, alternate leaved, okay, and a simple leaf, okay. So make sure you know the differences between these. This is tulip poplar. Tulip poplar has a very soft wood. It's uh, uh, wood carvers like it. It's used a lot of times to make siding and veneer. And um, it's said that Daniel Boone actually made a canoe out of a tulip poplar log so uh, has a lot of uses tulip poplar is a what we call a successional species in that it um, is a early grower in forest so it appears before other hardwood species do they grow really tall so they, they can capture uh, lots of light and um, they are a very um, important species ecologically speaking um, as far as the role that they play in successional forest, um, they come in and colonize areas after the pines uh, come in so that, that they're the, really the beginning of the hardwood forest that will develop over time. Uh, usually you see tulip poplar and red maple, which is what this one is. This is red maple. This one is also uh, palmately veined similar to the sweet gum so you can see that the vein originates here in the center point and then at each lobe it goes outward uh, unlike the others okay red maple is opposite leafed okay so if you look here you see these are opposite leaved okay so this leaf is directly across from its counterpart on the same node okay so opposite leaf they're also opposite branched okay most of the time if it's opposite leaf it's going to be opposite branched okay so you can see the branching pattern here i can get this out of the way see these two branches or these two twigs are located directly across from each other again on the same node okay and then this is the internode internodal space here okay but this is red maple and it also is a successional species similar to the tulip poplar now tulip poplar if you look at the venation here whereas the, on the red maple it's palmately veined this is what we call pinnately veined okay similar to what you'd see with an oak tree okay so each uh, vein is running a different direction it doesn't originate at the uh, where the petiole meets the main part of the leaf okay so all these veins are coming off of a main midrib of the leaf that's this part right runs right down the middle the midrib and then all the veins come off from there okay so that's a another important thing to recognize okay right in here we have a nice clump of ferns okay this one is called christmas fern okay and christmas ferns name that because it is uh, green year round and um, these are quite mature. If we were to look at this in the spring, they would look a little bit different, okay? But uh, these will stay green throughout the year. Now, ferns, most ferns are um, carry all their spores, which is the reproductive structure of the fern, on the same frond. Some ferns have uh, two different fronds, okay? A fertile frond and a sterile frond. But in the case of Christmas fern, um, its, for, its spores are on a single frond so if we look at this uh, fern if we look at the lower part of the of the fern frond that's what this part is here okay it's green on the back side oh, it's particularly about the lower half of the of the frond or the lower two-thirds then we go up the frond a little bit and we notice that it's got these little brown spots on each little pinna that's what these things are on the uh, that come off of the midrib of the frond, the pinna, and you'll see these little brown spots, and those brown spots are called sori. And sori contain sporangia, okay, and sporangia contain spores. 
sporangia um, are little round structures and when they break open the little tiny spores come out those spores fall on the ground and then will become what's called a gametophyte which is one of the stages of frond reproduction then those gametophytes will um, spread their gametes okay and then will become a sporophyte and that's what this is actually this whole thing is a sporophyte okay and it releases its spores to start the process all over again but it's quite a complex process ferns are what we call um, lower vascular plants okay they're not they don't have the same type of um, vascular structure that regular plants have they have what's called a rhizome underground and um, their reproductive system is different than that of normal plants because it's a two-stage uh, process so uh, pretty pretty interesting but this is uh, one of the more uh, prevalent ferns that we have in our area this is christmas fern all right so we were just talking about the christmas fern and the difference between uh, those who have one frond and those that have two. And this one is called grape fern, southern grape fern. And it's an example of a fern that has two different types of fronds. The first one is down here at the bottom. Okay, if you need to look at the stem here, you can see it's got two stems. Okay, one bearing the sterile frond. Okay, the other bearing the fertile frond. And this is where the spores are. Okay, grape fern is a fall fern, so it puts it produces its spores in the fall. Okay, and it's very similar to another fern called rattlesnake fern, which generally produces its spores in the spring. Okay, but they're very closely related. The leaves look somewhat similar, okay, and they have the same structure, okay, as far as the spore bearing structure. Generally, what you see is with with the, the grape ferns is their stems um, grow uh, separate directly from the ground. Okay, so that kind of sets them apart from the rattlesnake ferns. So let's go over here. Here's a rattlesnake fern. Okay, this is what this one is here. And its, it's spore bearing structure is already gone. Okay, but it would usually have its spores where the, 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 the spore uh, stem would be located further up on the main stem. Okay, so, and if you look at the, the leaf dissection, it looks quite a bit different. I'm looking around to see if there are any other um, rattlesnake ferns around that still have anything left of their uh, fertile frond, and I don't see any. But look at the difference between rattlesnake fern and grape fern because here's a grape fern right here growing beside it you can see the difference in the leaves okay this one doesn't have a fertile frond um, for whatever reason or it could have broken off or who knows what okay here's another one right here it's got its fertile frond okay right here so and it's called uh, often called rattlesnake fern because Supposedly, this part right here where the spores are favors uh, a ra the rattle of a rattlesnake. And so it was, that's one of those common name things that you see a lot where if something looks like something, then it gets named that. And a lot of times it's associated with being a cure for something uh, like snake bite or, or whatever. So that's how these things a lot of times get their names. But this is a southern grape fern. All right, here's another plant with simple leaves okay this is a simple leaf because it does not have um, any other features attached to it okay it's 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 not a compound leaf because it doesn't have leaflets okay it is alternate okay because we got a leaf here a leaf here so there's a space between the nodes okay and only one leaf per node Okay, sour wood, which is what this is, has what we call a serrate leaf. If you look on the, the leaf margin, okay, it's serrated, 
you know, like a serrated edge knife. Okay, and sometimes you'll see little hairs growing out on the edge of these, and these have already don't have them because it won't be long these leaves will be dropping off but young leaves if you in the spring you can actually eat the young leaves of sour wood it's kind of got a, a some bit of a citrusy taste but sour wood is an important source of nectar for bees and is used to make sour wood honey so it's a very important uh, plant in the forests of the southern Appalachians and a good one to have around if you want to keep bees. Now here's a very young American holly. Okay, it's got these spiny edged leaves. Okay, that's very has a very thick uh, cuticle, very waxy feeling. Okay, very stiff. Okay, but holly is a an evergreen species, and it's important to understand. What evergreen means when we say evergreen it means it is stays green year-round so holly does not shed its leaves the way other deciduous plants do it is a what considered a deciduous plant okay it's a flowering plant because it, it has flowers and has fruit okay so it's not a conifer okay conifers or coniferous uh, trees um, bear cones and their reproductive uh, system is a little different than that of flowering plants. Um, but these plants, they, they have evergreen leaves, and so they don't lose their leaves like everything else. When the leaves die, which they do periodically, okay, they'll just fall off and they already have a replacement in place. Okay, but it, they don't drop their leaves seasonally like all the other uh, trees do. In the, in the forest okay but these produce red berries in the winter time this one this small would not produce any berries but larger ones will produce red berries that are very valuable for wildlife consumption particularly birds but uh, they're quite a interesting uh, species so here's a fun little find wasn't exactly expecting to see this this is called pine sap and pine sap is a parasitic plant. Okay, this plant, it has no chlorophyll whatsoever. Instead, it actually feeds on mycorrhizal fungi. So there's fungi that are found in the soil here, okay, that other plants depend on to grow. And those mycorrhizal fungi have these long structures that help supply water to certain plant species. And pine sap attaches, it has uh, these other these feeder roots that attach those mycorrhizae and it draws nutrients from those. So they're making it parasitic. But if you look up and down this plant, you see it has no chlorophyll, because if it did, it would be green. Okay, it has little leaf-like structures right here okay they're really more scales than anything okay but it's not capable of producing its own food it's related to this plant right here beside it this is mountain laurel okay both species are found in the heath family okay and the heath family includes rhododendrons mountain laurel uh, blueberries uh, things like that okay azaleas they're all in the heath family there's three species that are similar to this. Um, you have pine sap, which is one of them. There's another called Indian pipe, which produces white flowers. Okay, but they look somewhat similar, but there's only a single flower per stalk. And then there's another species that, bloom, uh, that blooms in the spring called sweet pine sap. Okay, and it's um, also closely related to this, but it's brown with purple blossoms. Uh, but all of them are, or all three of those are unique in the fact that they are uh, parasitic plants growing on the roots of other things. So very, very cool. I'm really glad I got to see this species and be able to share it with you all. Okay, this is a coniferous species here. This is white pine. Okay, white pine is one of 
three species of pine found in the Dittmer Watts Park. Okay, um, a little out of breath because through climbing up the hill. White pine, you can tell it is white pine because if you look at the needles, they come in bunches. And typically white pine comes five needles to a bundle. Okay, they're bundled up. They have a wrapping around the needle bunches okay, that's called a fascicle. Okay, but generally, most all of those bundles have five needles um, per bundle. And white pine needles are high in vitamin C. Okay, so you can actually put these into teas. You can make a tea out of the needles and it'll have kind of a citrusy tasting flavor. Okay, the white pine also has good resin. So if you were to go and skin the bark off the tree, um, it will start to bleed. And you can take that resin, that sap, and it makes a really nice glue. Uh, and you can also use it to uh, help light fires with, okay, because it's very volatile. So it'll burn. But white pine is quite a resource uh, plant, uh, particularly for its needles. But it produces cones, hence why it's called coniferous. Now this one's not looking too healthy and it's probably mainly just because it's kind of being shaded out by other things okay and there are some blights that will affect white pine and pine bark beetles can get them and things like that although i don't think this is a pine bark beetle issue that's affecting this one okay but because it's coniferous it means it bears cones and this one doesn't have any that i can see um, but it also holds on to its needles. Its needles are evergreen, so it doesn't drop them the way deciduous trees would drop their leaves. But white pine, very cool. Here's another one of our coniferous species. This is not a pine though. This is called Eastern Hemlock. Okay, and you can tell that it's different from the pine as far as the needle structures are concerned. It has these very short little needles. Okay, and they act the the way they grow on their twigs is a little different okay they the needles are flattened and they tend to be in the same plane that's one way you can tell eastern hemlock from carolina hemlock which is looks a little bushier and the needles go off of different planes um, but both species are being impacted by an exotic invasive pest called the hemlock woolly adelgid and it's destroying hemlocks all throughout its range, okay, both eastern and the Carolina hemlock. And this insect pest attaches itself at the base of the needles, and from there it sucks on it like a vampire until eventually it will kill the tree. And this one is not looking so great, okay, because it is infected with hemlock woolly adelgid. And you can see out, particularly out on the outer uh, parts of the, of the branches, that they don't have as very thick lee or thick, thick needles and that's because of the impact that's occurring on this plant this 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 tree is not long for this world i suspect it'll be dead in a couple years uh, unless treatment were to occur and you have to treat these things with insecticidal soaps and that helps to get rid of it but this one may be too far gone to save if it were to be treated which is a shame but at one time hemlocks were a large part of the southern Appalachian forest and it's only the, their demise has only occurred within the last 20 years so once mighty trees are now reduced to skeletons because of this invasive pest and these are what we call a keystone species ecologically because so many forest communities depend on them and the, and the members of those communities depend on them for shelter and food sources. They actually provide shade over river systems, which uh, is necessary for uh, trout uh, to survive. So that's where you see them a lot in mountain communities is along rivers uh, growing over these, uh, the streams and everything, providing shade for that water, which is necessary. So it's a shame to see these trees being reduced to mere skeletons.
It's a shame. Now here's a good example of a plant that has a compound leaf. Okay, this is called Tree of Heaven. And actually it's a non-native invasive species. Um, it's not a good thing to have around. If this is another uh, invasive species that poisons the soil to limit competition. Okay, but it's a great plant to point out as an example of something that has uh, compound leaves. We've already seen several with simple leaves. This one's compound, okay, because each one, okay, of these things here is a leaflet, okay? This whole thing is a leaf, okay? If we look down here, it has a leaf petiole, and if you break that off from the stem, okay, you can actually see a, bu a little bud there that's starting to appear, okay? But these occur at the nodes, okay? The leaflets are opposite of each other, okay? But the leaves themselves are alternate, okay? So you see here at a node and at a node, okay? And then the inner node in between, okay? So these are alternate leaved as opposed to opposite leaved, okay? But it has a compound leaf and each of these are leaflets and you can't record this on camera but the air has a smell a pungent odor to it and it's because of this plant okay uh, this plant has enough of certain toxins in it to actually make it somewhat dangerous for people who have heart issues and it's said to be a, a plant that can actually induce cardiac arrest in people who have heart conditions I don't know how much truth there is to that. This is just something that I have, have heard, but I know it's not good for other plants that are found growing around it. And I like to do everything I can to get rid of these. Of course, this one's too big for me to just simply pull up. I'd need a hand tool to be able to rub it out of the ground. But uh, it produces these winged fruit and seeds, which when they break loose they just kind of drift in the wind and that's how it gets carried and spread is by by the wind so it's quite a, a notorious invader and i'd like to see every one of them uh, gotten rid of but anyway it's apparently here to stay all right so let's look at this particular plant right here this is called partridge pea okay this is a member of the pea family okay you can actually see uh a little fruit starting to grow there that little bean like structure and we'll actually here's another one right here it's got these little bean shaped uh, seed pods these are the fruit okay and inside they're little seeds they call this partridge pea because one of the things that likes to eat on it are quail now we don't see a lot of bob white quail around anymore it's kind of a species that's more found down in the eastern part of the state but they're disappearing but mainly because habitat has become somewhat scarce due to human development and fragmentation but partridge pea is a native species that uh, these quail will eat and um, it's actually a poisonous plant for human consumption but it doesn't bother the birds but it has this five petaled flower that you can see here okay and the, the each one of these types of flowers has a name okay um, it has um, one big petal at the top of the flower that's called a banner and then it has two wings and then at the bottom it has what are called keels uh, two keeled um, petals okay um, but that's a very characteristic flower type that you see with the members of the pea family. And also notice it has this little compound leaf here. Okay. Uh, so that's another way of being able to recognize this particular plant. So this is partridge pea.